Yeah, you like that? It took me like half an hour to get the fonts right. Anyway, it's my last video of 2012, and what better way to go out than with a ripoff? And this time around, it's one of the big ones. There were a ton of movies that tried to cash in on the success of Star Wars, but Star Crash is arguably the most notorious of them all. With the possible exception of... yeah, that's the one. We are talking about a movie with some serious bad movie credentials here. For starters, it was directed by Italian schlockmeister Luigi Cosi, whose other films include the alien knockoff Contamination and the 1983 Hercules movie featuring Lou Ferrigno. So yes, we're dealing with a movie made by a guy who later went on to direct this. And to top it all off, the movie was even produced by B-movie kingpin Roger Corman, a guy who could make a movie about the fall of the Roman Empire using only the change found under his couch. But as stated in the text crawl, there is one good reason to see this movie, namely the fact that it stars 70s uber-hottie Caroline Monroe. Caroline Monroe. Right, um, Caroline Monroe, um, well, uh, let's, uh, let's get to the movie, shall we? Hey, this is encouraging. Corman actually splurged on two types of construction paper for his company logo. You know, maybe I'm being too hard on this movie. I mean, it hasn't even really started yet, and I'm already ripping on it. Maybe it won't be the shameless rip-off I think it is. By the way, I like this scene better when they did it in Spaceballs. Alright, there's still time to turn this thing around. Let's see where it goes from here. The first Star Wars movie wasted no time putting us right in the middle of the action and started with an exciting space battle. So, how does this movie begin? Major Bradbury to communication bridge. Nuclear comm force to main engine room. Nuclear comm force to main engine room. Major Bradbury to communication bridge. Major Bradbury to communication bridge. Star Crash. Thrilling adventure as a man waits patiently on an elevator. Gasp in amazement as he tries to fix a paper jam in the ship's photocopier. What is it like, the planet we're approaching? Nothing but ice and snow. A barren desert of whiteness. Oh, come on. They're gonna rip off the ice planet thing, too? Wait a second. This movie came out before Empire Strikes Back. Holy shit, did Star Wars actually take something from this movie? Scan it with our computer waves. Oh yes, yeah, scan it with our computer waves. Then digitize it with our atomic ray machine and reverse the polarity of the molecular neo-fusion reactor science space technology stuff. It must be the future! <laughs> These guys are on a reconnaissance mission when they wander too close to a rip-off of Fantastic Voyage and are promptly killed. Ah well, roll credits. Oh, I'm sorry, Lewis Coates? Yeah, sure. You're not fooling anybody, Luigi. You're about as American as Tommy Wiseau. After the credits, we meet our protagonists, interplanetary smuggler Stella Starr and her permed sidekick Acton, who are currently on the run from... Aha, uh -huh, looks like the cops. The cops? The cops? Really? Not... Galactic law enforcers or interplanetary peacekeepers, just the cops. I mean, what, is one of them going to be a robot with a goofy southern accent or something? Stella, you cheap smuggler. I am police robot L. You have the right to remain silent. I really need to stop giving this movie credit. So while being pursued by Sheriff Roscoe P. Cylon here, Stella and Acton manage to escape by entering hyperspace. <laughs> Total disintegration, 30% molecular ignition, 
20% gamma contamination. You're very reassuring. I assume that means we have a 10% chance of making it. Well, I know there's a 100% chance that that's not actually Caroline Monroe's real voice. Plot us a new course so that cop can't find us. Even as you speak, it's been taken care of. What in the universe is that? You know, I'd like to say that this dialogue is stilted and cheesy compared to Star Wars, but... I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. <sighs> hey, it's the orb from Heavy Metal. Odds just got a lot better that this movie might have some nudity in it. Stella and Acton come out of hyperspace in the Christmas light galaxy, but are almost immediately found by the cops again. However, these space pigs aren't going to get these plucky adventurers without a fight. This time you've won. We surrender. Okay, maybe they will. Meanwhile, at the space... hand, we get introduced to our villain, Count Zarth Arn. He's basically the movie's Darth Vader, that is, if Darth Vader were a greasy Italian guy with a haircut that looks like if Wolverine were a vampire. The Count and his army of Flash Gordon extras are trying to conquer the universe because... Hey, dude's got a cape. I mean, you can't wear a cape and not try to take over the universe, right? Mm-hmm. While that's going on, Stella and Acton get put on trial, with Stella sentenced to a lifetime of hard labor putting balls into a hole. I'm sure there's an innuendo in there somewhere, but I'm too lazy. I've been at this for 12 straight hours. You'd better work, if you don't want a taste of the burning of the energy whips too. But there must be a way to escape. Hey, if it keeps you in that outfit, I don't mind if you stay here the rest of the movie. But of course she does decide to escape by staging a rebellion and then leaving about five seconds after it starts. By the way, it's good to know that in the future they finally mastered lasers that can shoot at different angles. Oh, and then the whole prison blows up and kills everybody inside. Hey, at least Stella escaped. A few more hours in there and she might have broken a sweat or something. Almost immediately after she escapes, Stella gets picked up by Thor and L, the two cops from earlier. We were sent to free you. Your sentence has been cancelled. Oh, okay, so that means those people in the prison died for absolutely no reason. You literally could have waited 30 more seconds and you would have been free. How is it we're less than 20 minutes in and so far the hero has killed more people than the bad guy? Well, I've been assigned to a top secret Imperial mission. We must now leave and set Acton free. <laughs> well, that was quick. I didn't edit anything out there. They just say that they're going to set Acton free and literally the next scene he's free. This is like they tried to condense all six Star Wars movies into one film but didn't want to skip any scenes. Stella and Acton have been recruited for a top-secret mission by the Emperor of the Universe, played by... Christopher Plummer? What the hell is he doing in this movie? Was he on so much coke in the 70s he just thought this was a really artsy production of Hamlet? I mean, it's not like this would be the only time he's confused sci-fi with Shakespeare. To be... or not... Be. The Emperor has recruited Stella and Acton to find Zarthorn's secret superweapon, which is... Are you ready for it? The size of an entire planet. Yeah, suck it, Lucas. There's none of that small moon bullshit for this movie. They went all the way up to a whole planet. This movie's dick is bigger than your movie's dick. There's something else. Search for the commander of that missing ship. He was my only son. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a respectable acting career to get to. The first possibility is the Auriga system. Oh yeah, I should probably mention, Acton is kind of the Jedi of this movie in that he has a bunch of special powers, but I'm not really sure what they are. Most of the time his powers just seem to come into play whenever the movie needs him to move the plot along or the director wants to show off some scribbly optical effects. Of course, I know what Acton's true talent is. Spreading the word of the Lord. My God shall supply all, 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 Thank you, Jesus. The heart of the haunted stars. An unknown planet named Eurekis. If it has a name, then it's not really unknown, now is it? Stella and Elle go down to investigate the planet, but are soon captured by... Look! Amazons on horseback! Amazons? Oh, please let them be the sexy kind. Take my revenge. 
Kill him. You know what that means, fellas. Cat fight time. Hi, Kiva! Hi! Stella ends up getting captured by the Amazons, but then five seconds later, she's free. This movie doesn't like to dwell on things too long. I mean, if you can't wrap up a plot point in under a minute, is it really worth telling? Guardian, take my revenge. <laughs> really? You're really gonna make me do this reference too? All right, here it is. Tails. By the way, every time I watch that movie, I always think to myself, you know what this is missing? Tits on the statue. Stella and Elle escape from the Amazon planet and set off for another planet. Hopefully one that isn't inhabited by references to better movies this time. The entire planet is covered with ice and snow. And you must be extremely careful when the sun sets. The temperature drops thousands of degrees. And in an instant, everything freezes over. Okay, so it's like Saskatchewan in January. Stella and Elle investigate again, but this time they don't find any Amazons. In fact, they don't find much of anything. It's almost as if these planet sequences are inessential to the plot or something. We'd better hurry. We've run out of time and our power pack reserves are nearly finished. With night approaching, Stella and Elle decide to hurry back to the ship. I said they decide to hurry back to the ship. Uh, you do realize the sun's about to go down and you're gonna freeze, right? You might want to at least jog. Look, the sky's in more of a hurry than you are. Oh yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's real impressive there, Acton. It turns out Thor is working for Zarth Arn, and he knocks out Acton and leaves Stella and Elle to freeze outside. What a shame, the guy looks so trustworthy. You were expected here hours ago. That was the take they used. But Thor underestimated Acton's ability to... eventually wake up after being knocked out, and the two of them fight. Prepare to enter the perm. <laughs> Put down the gun. Silly bitch, your cheesy effects cannot harm me. These deadly rays will be your death. <laughs> Shit. He killed Thor and the soundtrack. Then you knew about Thor. Yes, I did. So you see into the future. <laughs> oh, really? Did he see this coming? <laughs> All these years, you never told me. You would have tried to change the future. Yeah, then you might never have done Slaughter High. And that is not a world I want to live in. They go to yet another planet, but this time it's actually the right one. Too bad they don't have any idea what to do when they're confronted with the Count's weapon. What's happening? Power failure! Oh my god, the Count's secret weapon is a giant gelato machine! The Fiend! What is it? It must be the Count's weapon! You know, I would make fun of the acting in this, but do I even need to? Isn't that almost like shooting fish in a barrel with the Death Star? The attack's over. You'll be alright. Okay, so let me get this straight. All the Count's weapon does is give people headaches for a few seconds, after which they're completely fine. Yeah, I think you're gonna need a better weapon there, Count. No time to dwell on that, though. We've got more exciting walking scenes to get to. The terrain looks a little rough, but thankfully Stella remembered to shrink wrap herself this time. They find a spaceship, but soon get attacked by some cavemen who proceed to capture Stella and turn Elle into a Rock'em Sock'em robot. You know, I'm noticing a pattern here. Even though she's the main character, Stella hasn't really done much in this movie. She mostly just gets in trouble and it's up to Elle to bail her ass out. And the minute Elle's not around to help her, she gets captured. This is just like in Barbarella, where the supposed hero just bumbles around and relies on other people to save her. Why is it in sci-fi the woman still has to be the damsel in distress even if she's the hero? Help! Help! Ah, don't worry, Stella. I'm sure a big strong man will come by and save you. Hey, look, there's one now. 
man, the Italian ripoff of Zardoz is even weirder than I thought it would be. Actually, this is the Emperor's son, Simon, played by... David Hasselhoff? Great, now I have to do this reference. This is an energy shield mask. It allows you to move the plot along by pulling bullshit out of your ass. Simon and Stella get attacked by the cavemen again, but they're soon found by Acton who saves them using his... Okay, I think you crossed the line with that one, movie. There's homage, and then there's this. I think George Lucas gonna sue somebody. Acton, thank God you got here in time. For a second there, I thought I might actually have to do something. Acton then informs them that the planet they're on is really Count Zartharn's secret weapon. This is the Count's secret domain. The very heart of the Phantom Planet. I always thought Phantom Planet lost their heart when Jason Schwartzman left, but to each their own. No sooner do they find the planet's control center when they're met by the Count himself, who has what has got to be the most counterproductive plan for killing them I think I've ever heard. In less than an hour's time, all that will be left of this planet will be ashes and cosmic dust. Then, you will be among the dead. Isn't this your planet? You know, the super weapon you were going to use to conquer the universe? You're really going to blow it all up just so you can kill these three? You have guns! Why don't you just shoot them? Fuck it. The Count decides to leave in his superhero mask ship, but he does leave behind his two bionicle robots to guard them. But they didn't count on Acton's light sit... <laughs> Sorry. I mean, laser sword. The robots even make the mistake of hassling the Hoff. You know, let's just take a moment to soak this all in. We have David Hasselhoff sword-fighting stop-motion robots with a lightsaber. There are not too many movies you can say that about. Oh, okay, so Acton can survive point-blank laser blasts, but apparently his weakness is mild shoulder injuries. Go. It's your duty. You must live. Don't worry. I'll live forever. Yes, yeah, strike him down and he shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. And by that I mean he turns into a cheesy effect and never appears in the movie again. So long, acting, you crazy... Jedi... Wizard... Alien... Whatever the hell you were supposed to be. Okay, so they got rid of the robots, but how are they gonna get off the planet in time? No problem! The Emperor stops by and he even remembered to power up the convenient plot device machine. Imperial Battleship! Halt! The flow of time! In the space of three minutes, every molecule on this planet will be immobilized. Why do I get the feeling this movie is making itself up as it goes along? Yeah, oh well, no more super weapon. What the fuck? <laughs> so having finally clued in that Count Zartharn is kind of a bad guy, the Emperor decides to mount an assault on the Count's, uh, hand fortress. By sunset, I'll be the new Emperor. And I will be the master of the whole universe! How? You blew up your super weapon, you fucking moron! What's your brilliant plan now? You're gonna kick yourself in the balls and then crash your ship? We then get the customary space battle, and this one stands out from Star Wars in a very important way. You wanna know how? The heroes don't do anything. They just sit back and watch while a bunch of people we've never seen before do all the fighting. How would you like it if in Star Wars, instead of blowing up the Death Star, Luke just said, Nah, that's cool. I'm just gonna go take a nap. Let me know when you save the universe. These are some of the most passive space heroes I've ever seen. What's even weirder is that the good guys actually lose this space battle. The yeah! It's over. In retrospect, we probably should have helped out. My bad. No, there's still a way. There's one solution left. The floating city. Floating City. Of course, the Floating City! That thing we've never seen before has never even been mentioned, and we know nothing about. It's sure to work! And surprise, Stella actually decides to pilot it. Whoa, you mean the protagonist actually helps to defeat the bad guys? No way. 
But of course she's gonna need some help. This is incredible. They rebuilt you. But how? You look marvelous. Very carefully, and they use the latest components. I feel like a new machine. Yeah, too bad they didn't install a better accent. Okay, so there's some stuff about going into another dimension, and then they have to come out at exactly the right time for it to work or something, but as far as I can tell, the plan is basically to just ram this big space city into the Count's ship. Oh well. Abandoned city! I WANTED TO BE IN THE SEQUEL! Hey, she's in a spacesuit. Oh, please tell me she reenacts the opening scene to Barbarella. Damn it. The stars are clear. The planets shine. We've won. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to do Shakespeare on London's West End and try to forget I was ever in this movie. So there you have it, one of the most infamous Star Wars knockoffs ever. But is Star Crash really that bad? Yeah, it's... it's bad. I mean, it's incredible. This movie makes Barbarella look like 2001 A Space Odyssey. But the real question is, what kind of bad ripoff is it? Is it fast-paced and entertaining like Mighty Peking Man? Or is it tedious as shit like Ape? I would say entertaining. If you're willing to turn your brain off and just go with the sheer ridiculousness of everything, you can actually have fun with this movie. To give Luigi Cosi credit, you can tell he's a big fan of science fiction, and the movie does have a kind of childlike energy to it. So if you're in the mood for a slice of grade-A sci-fi cheese, they don't come much stronger than this. Oh, and of course there's Caroline Monroe. Well, that's all for now. Until next time. We've just survived an attack of the most powerful weapon in the entire galaxy.